Welcome to your introductory webinar for Lightspeed Pause O series. Uh, so today we're going to be going over you know, the basics of the uh, the back office and the point of sale. Those are the two modules that we're going to focus on for today. And the idea behind this webinar is for you to feel comfortable enough to start navigating the system yourselves. And I think more importantly, to start customizing certain features and modules and product layout to suit the needs of your specific business. So a couple of things to note. Um, if you do have any questions, guys, please just pop it in the uh, in the question box there. And then someone from the customer success team will get back to you um, within the day. Uh, so let's move on. Let's get started. So um, first off, you know, just to meet your team here. Um, so I'm a part of the launch team. I am a customer success manager. Sorry, my name is Joel. And the idea behind the launch team is that we look after your onboarding journey, um, as well as help you uh, navigate and train you up on the, uh, on the platform so you feel comfortable using it. If you ever need to contact us, we work Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 5.30, and that's Sydney time. And if you ever need to contact us in general, you can use that success at counter.com email address. And then one of the team will just get back to you as soon as we can. We also have a 24 seven support team. A couple of things to note about them is, um, you know, anything urgent that you need uh, assistance with, you can always contact them. There's different ways to get in contact with our support team. And these are things that I will cover a little bit later on. But as you can see from the bottom right hand corner, you can email them at support at counter.com. And then we also have the Australian and New Zealand number there as well. So anything urgent, please contact uh, the support team, anything related to hardware or payment support, anything of that matter, you can always contact our 24 seven support team. So moving on, talking about Lightspeed payments here, I'm not sure if everyone on this, uh, on this call, on this webinar has um, opted to use Lightspeed payments, but just a couple of things to go over here. Um, as soon as you receive your hardware, your, your Lightspeed payment terminals, please ensure that you uh, plug them in and get them charged because when you're ready to actually follow the guide, which I'll show you in a bit, to get the payments uh, integrated with the platform, you do want to make sure that they are fully charged and ready to go. And then the other thing to note there is that as soon as you are integrated and you're ready to start using the terminals, please just process a dollar amount as soon as you can. The idea behind this is that the first payout, um, it does take five days for the, uh, for the first deposit to enter your account. So that being said, if you, you know, as soon as you're set up, you put through that dollar amount, you're going to bypass that five days, you'll get that dollar after five days. And then moving forward, you're going to start getting into the regular routine of getting your payouts when you should, which is every other day. Great. So a couple of things just to go over here as well. Um, first off, very basic. How do we log in to Lightspeed to the point of sale and to the back office for that matter? So uh, the URL is my.counter.com. And then you will have been given a or sent a onboarding email. So that email address, you can always pop it in there. And then if you have, uh, if it's your first time logging in, there's a forgot your password button that you can click. And then from there, you can set up your password and then you're good to go. Also, just on that, that's to log in to the, uh, into the platform via a desktop or a computer. But then we also have the app, obviously. So that this, the bottom left hand corner here, you can see the photo of our app. It's the orange flame logo. And please ensure that you're downloading the restaurant O series app, as there are different, there are a few different type of uh, of light speed uh, apps to download. So in terms of uh, you know finding out about your hardware or um, contacting someone to get additional hardware, you can always just contact our sales team directly, and they can assist you there. And just on hardware as well, here the last point: if you are waiting to find out where your hardware is, you can always email us at hardware at counter.com. And then obviously if we have a tracking number, we'll send it over to you or we'll give you an estimated uh, time of arrival for that bad boy as well. Um, so when can you start using the additional modules and integrations? Um, the idea behind this webinar is to really focus on, you know, you know, pause and back office 101. So over time, once you're comfortable, we can start having those chats about those additional features, modules and integrations. But for now, we're really just going to be covering the basics. Very important to have a sound fundamental understanding of how the, um, the basics work first. And then we can start getting into more advanced um, features and modules and integrations as well. Great guys, well, let's just jump into the pause now and we'll get started. I'm just gonna open up my link here. So this is the link there, my.counter.com. I'm already logged in, ready to go, or I'm about to be. Obviously my password is set up already, hopefully, and we're ready to go. Awesome, so this is the back office, guys. So the idea behind the back office is, it's pretty much the hub of the platform. 
a lot of the changes that you're going to make to your products and when you're looking at um, you know adding any additional features and integrations managing your stock pretty much a bucket load of what you want to do in the system it's going to be um, it's going to be done in the back office yet so just on this home tab on the left hand side here that I'm currently on um, we're currently under the dashboard page and as you can see we have the four different modules that we can access via the back office yet so first off we have obviously our point of sale we then have insights which is used for reporting and then we have our two inventory management modules we have purchase and produce purchase is used to place orders against your suppliers in order to increase your stock amount and then produce does the opposite produce we actually create recipes to decrement stock um, today we're going to be covering just the pause and the back office for now uh, but later to come we will have inventory um, inventory webinars to cover the purchase and produce uh, modules and then we're also going to start uh, um, applying the um, the insights training as well for you guys via a webinar so just again on this home page um, there's a couple of things to note here at the top um, this all has to do with pretty much the subscription that you have currently live with Lightspeed so you know invoices checking past previous invoices that have been uh, sent to you via um, Lightspeed you know how you're paying for your your subscription whether it's a bank transfer your credit card can be updated from the payment methods page and then obviously if you want to actually take a look at your subscriptions with us if you have multiple sites etc you're going to find the list of your sites um, right here so moving over to the my site tab on the left hand side this is a really great little snapshot that you're going to have um, just to see how you're tracking throughout the day so this top part of this page is showing you you know how many current sales uh, have you transacted what was the average per sale and then how much money have you actually banked so far and then you're also going to show you your open orders as well so a lot of the time you might have this page open at the front desk or with the host or maybe uh, in the office but the idea is that you can pretty much sum up this value to this one and you're going to get the current um, uh, transaction value that you've done so far or pending for the open order amounts there scrolling down we have some really cool tiles here just um, displaying different um, sales summary um, uh, points for the last seven days. So cool things like, you know, your top selling products, uh, sales by category and your top selling stock. You can all find this on this dashboard here. So moving over to our site information page. Very straightforward. This is where you're going to come to configure customer facing information about your site. So you can see here that I've already added a logo to my to my site. That's something that can potentially appear on your receipt. It's also going to appear on this uh, landing page, which is also a way to navigate to different modules. And then the idea behind your site information, as I said, it is customer facing. So please ensure when you're filling out this information, you know that your, you know, your email address is for uh, the actual site itself, no personal information there. Um, and then obviously, please ensure that you do add your Australian or New Zealand business number, as that is a mandatory field to fill out as it needs to appear on your receipt. In terms of um, you know, things that we're gonna cover later, but this is a, a section here just in the middle that you can stipulate how you're actually gonna be doing your takings or your reconciliation at the end of every service period. So you can select whether you'd like to do it by register, by site or by staff. And we'll cover that a little bit later when we actually dive into the process behind takings. Site address, pretty straightforward there as well. And then a couple other things to note here. So first off, based on the information that we provided above, you can then customize what is actually going to appear on the customer receipt. So as you can see, the site name and the business number are two fields that are mandatory. So this is you're unable to toggle this off, but the rest you can actually decide what you want to appear on the receipt or not. And you also have that footer that you can customize there as well. The other thing that I'm going to point out here is this site payment options. So on the pause, which I'm going to jump into in a second, um, there is something called a fast payment button that you can select. And just I'm going to cover it in a bit, but you can see here that you can actually customize what that button is going to do in the system. So that being said, let's jump into the pause. If anyone's uh, starting off and you want to uh, you know, manage going back and forth between the back office and the pause, you might have your computer open to the back office and you might already have your app downloaded on your iPad, in which case you could just you know, look at your computer back to the iPad and back and forth you go. But a lot of the time I find it quite easy to duplicate your tab in the back office. And then with that secondary tab, we're gonna access the pods. As you can see on the majority of the pages in the back office, you're gonna have this pause button at the top right corner. And that's how you can access the pods. You can also go to the home page and click pause here. 
And you also have that landing page where you can access the files. So let's just jump in there. And that's gonna bring me into one of my registers. And what this is doing is every time you're logging into uh, the pause, it's going to do something called a sync. And that's just going to bring across any updates that may have occurred in the back office. So here we have the users that I'm just going to log into uh, myself. And here we have it. Here's the pause. So just on the note of this uh, fast payment button that I was referring to earlier, um, as I said, you can customize what it's going to do. So as you can see, currently it's set as a cash payment type. And just to point that out, that fast payment button is this lightning bolt just beside uh, the checkout button. So bottom line is if you're putting through an order, you can go check out and hit cash or any of your other options. But if you do set that fast payment button to a particular payment type, you can just click this button and that's gonna quickly transact the value. Um, the, the, the order, apologies, and that's gonna obviously say that you've pretty much taken in $18 worth of cash. Great, so moving over to devices here at the top. Um, you know, there's a couple things here to, to go over when it comes to your registers. But first off, we want to understand what a register is. So um, a register is pretty much um, the, uh, the software aspect of linking the register with an actual iPad itself. So as you can see, I have three registers. Um, the, the point here is that if you do have a pause open, so you can see here if I go to help and support at the bottom, I can see currently I am logged into the bar point of sale. If someone else were to log in or use an iPad or a computer and log into that bar iPad, it's actually gonna kick me out of that iPad because it's only one iPad, so one physical device to one register. So if you ever wanna um, delete or add any registers, pop over to devices and you can create a new register directly from here. And then obviously you can name the register accordingly. Um, as I said earlier as well, you, you, every time you make a change in the back office or any change within the system, you always want to perform a sync on the in the back office here uh, in the pause. So if we go to the three bar menu at the top left, that's where we're going to find that sync button to bring across that change. The reason why I'm bringing it up is you can do a remote sync from the back office. So you might be a manager at home and you've quickly updated a new cocktail special leading into the weekend. And instead of giving a, your manager a call that's on site to go around to all of the online registers to sync them, you can actually just sync online registers or um, manually sync each register at a time. And that's gonna remotely just say, someone is performing a sync and it's gonna update whatever changes have been made. Um, uh, moving on with registers here, if we go into the uh, cogwheel against any register, that's gonna bring us into the settings for that particular register. And the key part about this is that, you know, based on the type of site that you are, you can configure each iPad or each register to kind of have a specific workflow or sequence of service that's going to assist your staff during trade. And obviously, you know, going through this, certain things are very straightforward. So, you know, if you leave the pause inactive for a set amount of time, it's going to log out. Everything here is pretty straightforward. We were talking about the fast payment button. So if you want, you can hide it or show it or whatever, you, whatever the case may be based on your side. But the ones that I want to go over specifically is at the bottom here where it says register workflow. So when it says you have fail, uh, finalized sale option, that's saying every time you send a docket to the kitchen or you finalize the sale by taking payment, what's going to happen on the pause? And you have two options here. Either you're going to stay on the sales page or it's going to take you out to that login page where I first put in my PIN number to access the pause. And if you think about it, if you're a, a, a heavy beverage venue or you know, a cocktail bar um, and you, you, know, you have five deep at the bar and it's very, it's very, very busy, the register that's on the bar itself, you might want that to stay on the sales page because you're going to want your staff to quickly put through an order, take the payment, and then get it ready for the next order. In which case, the flow of having it set to staying on the sales page really does make a difference when it comes to the speed of service. If you did have it set to the user page, that might be for a more slower venue that you want, you want to make sure that everyone that's putting through the order is putting it under their own name. So that means that if I were to put through an order and then it stays on my login, someone else might rock up to the pause and put through an order and maybe made a mistake or whatever the case may be. And then someone comes up to me and says, Joel, you put through this order, it's incorrect. That actually wasn't me. So in order to mitigate the, those issues from arising, you can have it set to going back to the user page every time you finalize the sale. And the other one I'm going to touch on is the sales screen default. So that means as soon as you log into a specific register, 
Is it going to take you directly to your pause? Um, sorry, to the uh, to the sale page. Is it going to bring you to your table layout, whatever the case may be? So again, that does matter based on where the register is located and the type of venue. But you might have, you might be, um, like I said, a cocktail bar where you wanted to just open up to the sales page and bang, you're ready to start taking orders. Or you might be a little bit of a fine dining restaurant, in which case you wanted to open up to your table plan or your held orders, because that's kind of more of the um, the style of venue and the way that you guys um, manage service. So that's just something to note about how you can um, manually adjust the different configurations for each register. And then, yeah, please don't forget to save your settings once you're done. Um, great. So that's a little bit about registers. Um, what we're going to do now is start having a bit of a play in the pods and as well as go through some of the different types of products that we find on the pause. So this page is pretty much the bread and butter of, of the back office here, because a lot of the things that you're going to be doing, obviously, are product related. So in the products tab here, we're currently under the products page. And this is where you're going to be managing all of your products and adding new ones and also obviously deleting them as well. So going through the, uh, the column headers to start, we obviously have the product name. What pause category are those products sitting under? Um, reporting groups. So in terms of how we report on certain products, we can allocate a reporting group to a product. And then we have the price and the sell tax. Uh, just further than that, if you do want to get into more granular information about a particular product, you can always jump into the cogwheel to the right of the sell tax column. And that's going to bring you into the product details page. From here, you can add photos to your, uh, to your pods. As you can see on my point of sale, I have a few logos there ready to go. And you do that by selecting this gray space here and then uploading your image. And I'm not going to jump on it too much because this is something that we'll cover during the inventory webinar. But this is where you can come to to find some more um, granular information about the settings for a product. So I'm just going to head back to my products page here. Perfect. So a couple of things to note as well here. Um, in terms of changing anything on this page, you can obviously do it directly from here. You make a change to a product name. Once you click anywhere, it's going to show you that that's been saved. Um, so that goes for anything. If you assign a product to a category or reporting group, price, sell tax, whatever the case may be, it's going to save directly um, once you once you make the adjustment on this page. So um, the other things to note here are the different types of products that we see. So you know, as an example, we have one cube. So that refers to one cube with a with a particular you know a drink. You might want one cube of ice, right? So this product isn't allocated to a pause category. The reason being is that it's actually a modifier. So that's something that we're going to cover a little bit later. But just in case you were curious why a lot of my products aren't allocated to a category, it's because they're modifiers. As an example, add sugar to a coffee. That's not in a pause category. That's tucked under an option set, which I'm going to cover in a second. Um, another type of product here is something called a variant. So a variant product pretty much means that in the wine category, I have this cosmetic button or a parent product that once you click into it, it brings you to the actual variant product. So the actual products that we sell. I'm just going to show you in the pause what that looks like. I'm just going to make this look a little nicer for us. Put it into a feature called dark mode. Great. So you can see here um, in the corner of your pause product tile there, you can see a V in the corner. So that's signifying that these products are variants. So if I were to go into my Tempro Neo here, that's the cosmetic button. It then brings me to the different variations that I actually sell. So as you can see, once I went into the variant, nothing has popped up on my order screen. But as soon as I select a glass of the Tempra Neo, that's the actual product. And now it's been added to the order. So that's what a variant is. And there's different ways that you can use variants. So variants can be you know, a different type of product. This is a bottle or a glass. You can also have a flavor or a size or a format, whatever the case may be. Another um, good example of a variant are, are tap beards. You might have a new towner variant cosmetic button. Once you jump into the new towner, we have the size choices of either the pint or the schooner. Another flow that I've used for variants, at least in this demo side here, is um, instead of having all my spirits on one screen, I've tucked them away into variants. So once I go into my rum variant, I then have the options of my two different types of rums that I've tucked under that cosmetic button. Great. And then the other type of product that we have here are the products that have the plus sign at the top right corner as well. So what these products, what that little plus sign is showing us is that there's an option set attached to our item. 
So I'm just going to jump in the products page. I'm going to jump over to where it says option sets. And the idea behind an option set is it's collecting a group of products that then prompts the user to make a choice. Um, so basically the idea here would be if we look at the add mixer option set and we drop this down. So under the add mixer option set, these are the modifiers that I've added to this option set. So what that looks like in the pause, if I go into my vodka O spirit, it's then showing me, do I want to add a mixer? And then I also have drink mods as well. So um, in this case, I've chosen my spirit and then the modifiers are showing us what type of mixer do you want to add? So this is going to be a vodka soda. And then the other option set that I've added here are my drink mods. They might want a specific type of glass or a certain type of ice or whatever the case is. In this case, it's just a vodka soda. So I can go ahead and save the order. So option sets, collection of products or modifiers that you can connect to another item, which then prompts the servers or the bartender or the manager to then make that choice. So again, I'll just show you um, another bear, uh, um, flow of having maybe a variant and an option set side by side. So in my X Benny, it's a variant. So once I go into my X Benedict, I then have my products themselves, which then have an option set attached. So I've chosen my X Benny. I'm going to get the X Benny with bacon. And then I've also added the Brecky Extras option set to this item. So I've chosen my X Benny with bacon, and I'm also going to add asparagus and toast and hit save. And there you can see I've added my modifiers to my base product by way of using a variant. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these test products here. I do that by hitting the cogwheel at the bottom right and hitting delete order. Perfect. So uh, moving forward, we're actually going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the two ways of, um, or the ways of creating a variant and also how to create an option set. So we're just going to use a beer as an example um, for the variant. So what I've done is I'm in the products page. I'm going to head to add products and we're going to use uh, stone and wood as an example for today. So stone and wood is the name of the product, or in this case, the cosmetic button. What category are we going to put it under? It's going to be under beer and cider, but it's a very popular beer. So I'm also going to add it to my fast bar. The sale price, because this is a variant, it's the cosmetic button. We don't need to set a sale price here, although a value is always needed as well as the tax code. So we're going to go ahead and just set it to $0 and GST. From there, we don't want to just add the product because we want to actually add variants to it as well. So we're going to go ahead and hit save and edit. Stone and wood already exists. Really good point there. If you do have a product in the system with the same name, you will need to make some type of amendment in order for it to actually save, as you can't have products in the system with the same name. So just added an asterisk there, and that should do it. So there it was added. And now we're going to head over to variants and create the variant. So this is showing us the attributes page. So based on the stone and wood cosmetic product or the base product, um, what are we creating here? What type of variance? And in this case, it's the size. So it's the size of the stone and wood that we're going to select. So we're going to add in size, hit add, and now we're going to hit save template and then yes. Now it's going to bring us back to the product details page, but we're just going to jump back into variance and hit add new variant. So what we see here is it's saying at the size is the value. Um, basically it's saying stone and wood is what size and what's the price. So we're going to say a schooner is eight dollars and then we're going to hit add variant there it is so you can see that that's been saved and now we're going to add a pint and that's going to be 10 bucks and i'm just going to go ahead and hit add variant again those are all of the um the variants that i'm going to create for the stone and wood so i can exit out of this box and if i go back to my products page and i search my stone and wood you'll see there stone and wood and there are my two variants that i've created so how does that look like on the pause I can go ahead and do my hit my little uh, three bar menu at the top left and hit sync. And now that's going to bring across my change. So let's give it a second, guys. Shouldn't take too long. It's just the one, one update. And there we go. So now you can see under my fast bar, I have my stone and wood variant. And also, I think I've added it to beer and cider as well. So there it is. So if we go back into our fast bar, we hit our stone and wood parent product. And then from there, I can select my schooner. Ta-da. Go ahead and remove that. Perfect. So those are variants. And now we're going to move over and start talking about option sets. So I, I showed you the example, a few examples of the, you know, the Brecky extras and the add mixer. But in terms of actually creating an option set, pretty straightforward there. We're going to hit the blue button there where it says create option set. What's the name of the option set? This might be um, 
uh, you know, chilled glass. So someone might want a, uh, a beer on tap or a bottled beer, and we want to ask them, do they want a chilled glass or not? So uh, chilled glass, and we just need to set a tax code there. This hopefully is tax free. There we go. So we've added our one choice there to our option set. So all we've done there is added the option. Like I said, the price zero dollars is mandatory as well as the tax code. And then and once that's done and you have your option set set, we can then jump into link to products. So we've created the option set and now we need to link it to the specific products or product that we want it linked to. So you can use the search box to bring up a certain category or whatever the case is, but I'm just gonna use the search to type in stone and wood and it's gonna bring up my options. So obviously in this case, I want it added to my, my, uh, my glass, my, my bottle of stone and wood in case someone wants to chill the glass. Uh, and then obviously the, the plant and scooter as well. So we can add it by just selecting this blank space, this field here, add option set, and then we can find it over here. Or in this case, if I wanna bulk add it to these three options, once I've made that selection, I can then hit bulk options. I wanna add an option set. And if I type in chilled, there is my option set, select it, and we're just gonna apply. So that works really well if you're adding like that add mixer to a bucket load of your spirits. You don't need to do it one by one. You can use that bulk feature to add it. Now that that's been done, three bar menu, hit sync, and that's gonna bring across our change. So just a couple other things to note about an option set. Once you've created it, you also have the option of creating a rule as well. So rules come into play when you wanna just allocate a minimum and maximum selection. So a really popular flow there is when you're dealing with your, um, your coffee choices for all of those cafes out there. If we jump into coffee here, once we select our flat white, our regular flat white there, we know that we only wanna select one type of milk. If someone asks for soy and full cream, um, that would deeply, deeply frustrate me. But um, yeah, so we, we, we have, I have added a rule of min one and max one for the milk option set. So now once I select my regular flat white, once I make a selection, because I've allocated that it's a maximum rule of choosing one option, once you select it, it brings you over to the next option set. And that really does help with speed of service. So you don't have to uh, you know, click and go back and forth or have to save your products there. You can just select your choice and it's gonna prompt you to go over to the next uh, option set. Do I want an extra shot? Yes, no sugar for me. So I can go ahead and save. And there it is. So what we did uh, earlier was we added the option set to this. So as you can see now, we have the plus sign. Do they want a chilled glass? Yes. Might be a fairly obvious option set there, but there we go. So there's that's how you create an option set. And you can really be a little bit creative about how you use it. So in terms of upselling, you know, you can use it for a margarita. So you see, you can see, choose my margarita. Do you want it spicy or not? No, they want a regular margarita or you know what? They've changed their mind. We can click onto the product again, jump into options and make it spicy instead. So that's option sets and those are variants. And um, obviously knowing how to kind of configure your products there, um, you can kind of move forward understanding what type of products might be better allocated to an option set and which might be um, better allocated to a, a variant flow. Um, so that being said as well, then we also just have a standalone product with, you know, as soon as you go into the pause, you can see the Negroni doesn't have a V or a plus on there. It's just a standalone product. We hit a Negroni and there it is. So those are the different types of products that you have in the system. And as I said, when we first started, spicy margarita, spicy mug there as a product. If I type in spicy mug, as I said, it's not allocated to a pause category because the margarita is placed under cocktails and phosphor. So the option set and the modifiers follow through with it. So there we have it. That's um, how to manage some products in the back office, as well as make some changes when it comes to variants and how to manage your option sets as well. Um, moving over to the POS categories at the top here, you can see this is my list of uh, POS categories. You can make the change directly from this page. And you can also just quickly add a POS category from here. And you can also delete directly from this page as well. As I mentioned earlier, we do have the option of allocating reporting groups, which I highly recommend. And the idea behind your reporting groups is, as it says, you know, based on looking at you know, a day's trade, um, it doesn't matter the, 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 the time, the period of service. Um, but the idea would be, you, know, you can set something as broad as food and beverages. So 
you might have um, you know, food and beverages set up as your reporting groups. You allocate all of your food to the food reporting group, your beverage to the beverage reporting group. And that way, when you look at day's trade, you can actually say, cool, 30% of my trade went to food and the other 70% went to beverages. You can get an idea here about how I've set up my reporting groups. So once you've allocated your reporting groups on this page, you can head back to products. And then all you can do is you can actually use the search um, option at the top right corner. So if we drop down and search category, you can obviously search a product name or search via the reporting group. In this case, I'm just gonna show you if we search one and hit filter, it's now gonna bring up all of my, my products in the wine category. And then from here, I've obviously already allocated my products to the wine reporting group on this page. But if you ever need to, once you've filtered, you can use that bulk options that I showed you in the option set there as well. So you can select all of your items, a couple different options here to do in bulk. But what I'm showing you now is how to assign a reporting group. And then from there, you can allocate it to, uh, to one and then go ahead and just assign it. So that's, that way, once all of your products are assigned, it really does help when you jump into insights for reporting, you'll get an idea about where the money's actually getting transacted based on the reporting groups that you've set. Uh, briefly going over suppliers here, um, this is where you're going to come to to link products to a default supplier for purchasing, but that will come later for your inventory um, my, uh, inventory webinar down the track. Moving over to the uh, people tab here, pretty straightforward there as well. You have users, customers, and suppliers. I'll start with suppliers here. All you need to do when setting up your suppliers in the system, add a new supplier, and we just need the company and the email address. Um, customers, anyone that you want to kind of keep tabs of the historical data against the customer, or you maybe plan on charging customers on account to pay later, um, you can come here to add the new customer, and then it's going to be visible in the pause. So if I jump back into the pause here, and I hit add a customer, there are all of my customers. Once I've allocated a customer to the, uh, to the order, you'll see there now I can charge Michael Jordan a uh, WAG group with Solar. Perfect. So that's how you add some customers to the system. You can also add a customer directly from the pause as well. Uh, maybe it's something that you're doing during service. And then obviously the most important bit here, I think are your users. So when it comes to adding the, um, the staff to the pause in the back office, you can do that from this page by hitting invite a new user. And then the big thing, the important thing to note here is that anyone that requires back office access is gonna need an email um, configured against their profile. Um, reason being, obviously, once you add that email address to your manager or supervisor, we're going to send them an invite and then they can use their email address to log into the back office, just like you would do in a second. So once we've added that um, the uh, username there, like I said, if they don't require back office access, email is not required, but everything else is mandatory, is optional. Once we have that set up, we can hit invite and edit user. And that brings us into this page. So from here, we can add a picture, an image for each uh, user. The PIN number is automatically set to four ones, but you can obviously change that PIN code directly from here. And then if we scroll down, you can actually customize what, what each user can do in the system. As you can see, this user does not have any back office permissions because there's no email address associated. But from here, you can just you know tick off the boxes in terms of what you want each user to be able to do different permissions they have in the system. And then there is an option to make a user an admin. That is just a quick and easy way of basically ticking off all the boxes for you. You might be an owner or a, um, a manager of the, uh, of the site, but then you also have an assistant manager or a venue manager that you want pretty much to have the exact same functionality and permissions that you do. In which case, as long as that email address is set for the user, you can go ahead and make them an admin um, for the site. So that's how we add a user. Um, obviously, once you've added a user, you must definitely do a sync to bring across that change, and then we're ready to go. So moving forward, what we're gonna do now is spend a little bit of time in the actual pause itself, which is the fun stuff. So as you can see here, we have our pause categories on the left-hand side, and then we have our products in the middle here with our order portion of the screen to the right. As I keep referring to during those syncs, we have the three bar menu at the top left, and then going through here, a sync just basically allows you to, like I said, bring across that change in the back office. History allows you to manage your refunds uh, through the pause. Printing will show you some printing configurations in terms of, you know, where do you want a receipt to print out? 
Maybe there's a certain printer that you don't want to print production dockets. That's something that we'll go over when we start jumping into uh, printer configurations. Takings is where you come to perform your takings. Um, accounts will show you anyone that's owing you money on account with your customers. Money in, money out feature has to do with um, basically managing your petty cash. You might start the day with a $100 float. Now you've given $5 to a bar back to run to the store to grab ice. We want to account for the $5 that's left the till. Pretty straightforward, hit money in, money out. You could say this was for ice and we took $5 worth of cash. And then you could just save that as a money out. Uh, moving forward, three bar menu, uh, go. Lightspeed payments will help you when you start getting configured with Lightspeed payments, obviously, to get that all set up. Product availability is a feature which we'll cover in a little bit. And then a couple other things that we can note here in terms of add-ons and preferences when it comes to like managing the layout and arrangement of the pods. Perfect. So like I said, POS categories here in the middle and products uh, in the left and products in the middle. What we're going to do here is start going through some different styles of orders. So you might be a venue that does, you know, quick bar service or over the counter service, in which case someone might rock up to the counter. They might get a Negroni and a regular fries, added the order to, added the products to the order. And then from there, we just want to check it out. So we're going to go ahead and hit checkout. The customer is going to be paying cash. So I'm just going to hit $26 there. And there we go. That has now transacted the sale. Um, and what that's going to do is as soon as you check out the order, it's also going to print the dockets to either the kitchen or the bar area, uh, just for the, the products to be made and served. The next style of service uh, of order that we're going to go through is table service. So the tables uh, here you can find at the top right. And the idea behind this is it is a feature that we need to enable in the back office. But for now, I obviously have it enabled. So we're going to go ahead and jump into tables from here. Um, we can obviously just select a table. So maybe I have customers sitting on table two. Uh, it's a couple, so there's two of them. And I'm going to go ahead and just save that. So now you can see that we have an order. And under this note field, it's allocated to table two. If I go back into the table plan, it's showing us that the table is blue, which is showing us that it's, uh, it's an active table. So going back into it, now we want to place a few items against the order. So maybe they've ordered a couple of drinks to start, spicy mug. And a, um, and, a, and a Negroni. So now that we've placed our drink order, we now want to send that to the bar to be made, but we don't want to check out the order because this couple is sitting at the table. They're going to they're gonna be here for a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and hit send instead. So send means that we're just sending the dockets to be made. So go ahead and press send. Now you can see if we go into tables, it's now green, which means that now that um, an order has been placed against the table. So now it's super active. Going back into the table, Maybe they decided they want to, they're finally ready for some food. So we'll go ahead and go into starters. They'll get the bone marrow and the chicken wings. And then for mains, maybe they'll get a chicken burger and a chicken pot. So now we're showing here that we're adding new items to the order and we'll go ahead and hit send. So now we have that going on. We go back into tables. You can also access any open order via the order screen here. So that's going to show us that this is for table two. You might be a fully packed venue and you actually now need to open up a bar tab. So in order to open up a bar tab, you can just use the note field here. So we'll click onto note and this might be for myself and we're just gonna go ahead and hit save. So now you can see this isn't allocated to a table. This is gonna be a held order and it's a bar tab for myself. So it's for Joel and I, what I'm gonna start off with is a tequila soda, go ahead and hit save. And we can also add multiple um, amounts of the one product. So maybe I'm with a buddy. If we click onto the uh, tequila soda there, I can actually change the quantity directly from here and hit apply the change. So now we have two tequilas and we're going to go ahead and hit, go ahead and hit send. When that gets printed out onto the, into the, into the bar, it's going to show my name at the top so that the, uh, the server or the waitress that's dropping off the order knows that it's for Joel. Hopefully you can find me. So now table two is ready to pay. So we'll jump back into table two. And what I'm gonna show you here is the functionality that we have in place to split the order. So if we go ahead and hit checkout and jump up to split payment, there's a couple options here. We might just wanna split the bill down the middle. So I can go ahead and hit split. That's just gonna break it in half. There might be a third person that's joined us. So we'll split it three ways. Or maybe I wanna just pay you know, $80 myself 
and then the remaining 29 can get paid. Obviously, you would check out each order individually. And then you could also split the order by product as well. So maybe I want to pay for the spicy mug, the bone marrow, and the burger. So I'll go ahead and check out this order first. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and pay cash. And then the remaining order, if we jump into it, we can just pay that off using uh, manual card. Is there a tip? No. Cool. So now you can see if we jump back into our table plan, table two is now available. And there's no table two now in our open order because it's been finalized. Jumping back into my tab here, obviously once I'm ready and I'm settled to go, uh, you can print the bill by hitting the cog wheel at the bottom right. And then you can go ahead and hit subtotal. That will print off a receipt. Once I'm happy with the order of $18, go ahead and check out that order as well. Perfect. So now those are the couple ways to place an order. We have um, a direct order or over-the-counter order where someone just comes up, places an order, and we check it out right away. And we know that as soon as we hit, hit the checkout button, it's going to obviously print those dockets into the uh, necessary printers for, for, uh, for production. We also have table service orders. So we can obviously select a table. You can configure different sections as well within your venue. Um, and then obviously, you know, that's going to be a held order because we don't want them to pay right away. So creating a held order by hitting send instead. And then once the table's ready to pay, we're good to go. And then the third is obviously placing a, uh, a note for a, um, a uh, open order or a bar tab. So that can also work really well for a, for a pickup order or a, or a takeaway order. You can always say that this is going to be a takeaway order. And it's obviously for Joel. Let's give that order type takeaway. And then, yeah, that way when I put through the order and I send it to the kitchen, that's then going to prompt the uh, the kitchen that it's actually a takeaway order. So they know how to prep it and bag it up for the customer. There we go. Check that out as well. So what I'm going to go through really quickly now is just how to place, um, how to uh, process a refund. So if we go into the three bar menu there and hit history, that's going to bring up all of the, the day's transactions. You can obviously filter based on, you know, certain date range like yesterday or seven days. But obviously, this is the $18 takeaway order. We're just going to go ahead and click it, refund sale, and then we can refund the sale. What was the reason? It was an unhappy, unhappy customer. And you can see here that the payment type was cash. Always recommend refunding it back as the same payment. So putting the cash back. That's also going to replace the Wagyu Brasola from an inventory movement standpoint. So make sure that if we're throwing that away, we put it through wastage as well. Perfect. That being said, if you ever do need to place uh, something through wastage, three bar menu add-ons, and you can go ahead to the wastage tab. And that way you can actually put through that Wagyu Brasola, right? So if that was made and then wasted, it was, um, uh, let's see, refunded, there it was, sorry one quantity and recall the wastage. Perfect. Great. So now we've gone through a little bit of processes there on the pause. Um, one thing that you can see here is that I have color coded and designed my pause a particular way. So just to give you an understanding about how you can do that, three bar menu as well. And if we jump down to preferences and then arrange items, from here what we're able to do is move our pause categories around and we can also move our products. On top of that, if we do just select a, a tile itself, we can actually add some uh, some color as well. So a lot of the time for, you know, you might have seafood uh, dishes blue, meat red, veggies green, whatever you think that might help your staff kind of navigate the pause a little bit easier. I definitely recommend adding color as it does make the, the, the pause nice and fresh. I'll just change this so we can see what it looks like on a iPad. Perfect, yeah, as you can see, it's nice when it looks uh, when there is some color added to the pause. You can see here yeah, that I've actually um, enabled that dark mode, so it gives it that nice black background. So heading back to the uh, to the back office here, what we're going to go over next is some features. So really important to note, um, you know, based on the type of service that you guys are offering for your venue, um, there's going to be a list of these different features that you can enable. Some of them are going to be free, so it's going to say that some are available on your plan. If you see a feature that isn't available on your plan, you can always contact our team and the account management team to maybe talk about upgrading your subscription to gain access to that type of feature. But the, the main objective here for today is just uh, to go through some of these features and understand how you can use them, um, obviously enable them, and what they all do. So if we were to go over something like dark mode, which I just showed you, jumping into dark mode, if we look at the overview, 
all of the features will give you an idea about what each feature can actually do. Some will have screenshots, even some will have some demo videos on how the actual feature or integration for that matter work. If it's something that you're into, you can go ahead and just enable the feature. Once you've enabled it, as I said, always, um, you do a sync to bring across the change, and then you can start using that feature and having a play. Obviously, something like dark mode is extremely straightforward, but if we go into, if you're uh, going through your, your features and you, you want to know a little bit more about adjustments, and maybe you want some help actually enabling it and actually utilizing the feature, that's when this help and support comes into play. This tab at the bottom left. It's something that's found in the back office and it's also available in the pause as well. And the idea behind it is that if we hit help and support there, you'll see at the top here, you have a search our, our knowledge base field. So if we're looking at adjustments, I can go ahead and just type that in, hit enter, and it's gonna bring me directly into our support uh, database where you can go ahead and then select the correct um, guard there. And this will give you a breakdown exactly about how to enable it, how to use it, and the different functionalities of the feature. So definitely something to consider there is that when you're going through the features and you have some more questions, just pop in the, the feature right here at this knowledge base deal, and that will bring you directly into that support guide. Uh, another thing to note while we're here, as I said earlier, you can always contact support via the email or uh, that phone number for Australia and New Zealand customers. But then you also have this chat to support feature, which is definitely the optimal way of reaching out to support. So you might be dealing with a bit of a printer issue or something to do with Lightspeed payments or Tyro or whatever payment device that you, uh, you decided to use. So you can go ahead and hit the chat to support button. That's gonna bring up this prompt here. And then from there, you can just send us a message. What, it, what is it about? Maybe it's about your hardware for printing. 24 seven, let us know what the issue is. Our team is extremely great at getting back to you. And then we can kind of troubleshoot that issue um, via the chat to support option. That's obviously going to be available um, via the pause as well. Help and support, chat to support team, and from there we can assist you. You can also even access that support guide directly from the, uh, the pause as well. So that's a little bit about features. If we have some time before the end of the session, I will show you a few cool ones that I think you might just want to enable right away. But before that, we want to jump into integrations as well. So integrations are going to be third-party software developers that we integrate with. So you know, if we go into something like online ordering, that's gonna show you all of the options um, for online ordering purposes. Obviously in this case, I've already enabled my handy um, Lightspeed ordering uh, integration there. But the idea is that you know, if you're looking at an accounting integration, whether it's Xero or MYOB or the other, um, you, know, you can find the, uh, the, the integration directly from here. It's gonna give you a little bit of information. Xero actually does have a uh, demo video there. But the idea is, again, if you're ever running into any issues with enabling it and getting it all functional, jump into our help and support guide there, type in zero, and there it is. Setting up your accounting integration with Lightspeed and a nice guide from top to bottom to show you how that all works. Um, obviously, any, any other questions that you might have that has to do with more training or whatever, you can always contact the customer success team. Um, but yeah, all of the integrations will be found directly on this page. And then, yeah, we can definitely go from there. So jumping back into the pause, there's definitely a couple more things that we can go over here. So from here, what we're gonna be going over is our process for doing our reconciliation or takings at the end of service. We definitely recommend doing your reconciliation and takings at the end of every service, only because if you decide that you wanna do it you know, every couple of days or once a week, if you do find a variance, in order to go back and find out where that variance derived from, it's a lot easier to go back during one day and find out where that problem is or where, where, that, where that variance came from. And on top of that, you're also gonna to wanna to use a reconciliation report found in our insights module. So having your reconciliation done every day is definitely gonna be a benefit there. So three bar menu, jumping into takings. We have done a few transactions today, so I should see a value there, and we do. So I can see that I've basically transacted $189 worth of products. And what I wanna do now is just perform my taking. So if I started the day with you know, $100 in my cash drawer, and then at the end of the night, I count my money and I have 185, I know that I've taken in $85 worth of cash. It looks like I'm still short $104. So what you can always do if you need to, is you can jump into your takings history tab at the top there. And if we find the line that says not yet finalized, jumping into it, 
under the recorded column for each payment type, it's actually going to show us the amount that we've transacted. It's important not to take that value and just slap it into our finalized taking sheet because we obviously want to actually account for the money that we're counting um, uh, you know, for that day's trade. So I can see that it was actually 131. Once I do a recount, I found that it actually was 131. And then in terms of the difference there, it's 58, and I'm aware that that is manual card. If we do have a variance, it will show the variance there for you. I can deal with the $1.75 uh, difference there. Um, something to note as well that I assume a, lot, a majority of you are going to be using Lightspeed payments or another type of integrated payment solution. And what's really great about doing takings uh, with that specific flow is that if you are using Lightspeed payments, it will actually show you Lightspeed payments and it will say automatically reconcile and the amount that was taken in from those terminals. So that really does save time at the end of the night. You, you, do, you only need to basically count your money and account for any other types of payment types that have been used. But anything that's been uh, transacted using any of those integrations, it actually automatically counts that number for you. You can always print out that settlement report to ensure that it's correct. But for the most part, yeah, light speed payments automatically counted or reconciled, and then it will have the value there ready to go. So once you're happy with your difference or you're, you know, hopefully you're, you're squared off, you can go ahead and hit finalize takings. Are you sure? Yes, I am. And that's going to bring us to that takings history page, in which case you can then print off this report to add it to you know, your DSR, your end of day report or whatever you have um, on site. Heading back, that's pretty, that's a, pretty much doing uh, takings in a nutshell. What you saw there were the different payment types um, other than uh, Lightspeed Payments and Tyro is they're all there under other payment types. And where to find that is under company settings in the back office there. And we can go under payment types and that just allows you to show you any type of integrated payment types that you have configured but then you can also add any other payment type that might be mandatory or, ne or, or needed for your site so something like bank transfers or prepayments or a manual card uh, option for whatever reason you can just hit add a new payment type show on checkout and add the payment type directly from there Great. So we do have a little bit more time. So there are a couple of features that I wanted to uh, just go over briefly because I find that they're amazing to use on the pause. So one that we saw earlier was this product availability. Um, I'm just going to jump into the back office and get to that feature for you. So as you can see, I don't have many uh, to discover because a lot of mine are enabled, but don't get confused about where to find them. And if I just type in availability, so there's the feature, jump into it little bit of a blurb there about um, uh, how it all works and what it's about but you know this one also does have actually it has screenshots and a video to watch but the idea is that as the name suggests it allows you to actually put a count on the remaining products that you have in stock so as an example I'm going to go ahead and select my product availability there and I'm going to select my Negroni because I'm running low you can make the product completely unavailable if you're completely out of stock but what's great is you can actually set a limit instead so what this is going to do is let's just say I'm looking at my batch of Negroni and I only have 11 Negronis available. So I can go ahead and save that and exit. And now you can see that attached to my product tile, it's showing me that I only have 11 Negronis left to sell. Based on what type of online ordering platform you're working with, you know, it's great if you're using Lightspeed ordering powered by Bubble. These are product availabilities that you set on the pause will actually trickle through to your online ordering service. And it works both ways. So if you sell one of these Negronis using Lightspeed ordering, it will then drop the count down to 10. So let's see what that looks like. Put through a Negroni, quick sell. And if I just hop back into FastFar, you can see there it's now dropped down to 10. So that's product availability. Great, great to use, only because definitely one of my pet peeves when someone orders something and we're out of stock. So that definitely does, uh, it's a good signifier to prep staff in case they ever come about that issue. Um, another one that I really wanted to show you was adjustments, which we touched on earlier as well. So jumping back into features, enabled and adjustments. As it says, yeah, it gives you the ability to predefine discounts and surcharges. So obviously you can set it up as, uh, as needed. But in my case, once I go into company settings, which is where you're going to find the feature, we'll jump up to adjustments. Really great to show you guys. You can just add a new adjustment here. Um, let's just say in this case, I've done a local legend adjustment and I've made it 
please ensure when you're setting up either an a discount or a surcharge that we're making sure that the discounts have a negative and the um and the surcharges don't as you don't want to charge a local legend 10 percent more than they should be paying so there we have it that's how you set up an adjustment add new adjustment name and the amount once you've done a sync on the pause it's going to bring across that change so let's just say we're putting through an olives and a pint and this is actually for a staff member who just finished off um, their shift. So we're gonna go ahead and hit the, uh, the cogwheel, jump up to discount. And then from here, we can say that it's for star fees and that's actually a 100% discount. So once that's been set, we can now just check out the order, obviously $0. What's really, really beneficial about using adjustments as opposed to using a custom adjustment. So a custom adjustment will look something like this. If you don't have the adjustments feature enabled, and you can definitely set this to 100% and not a problem if the reason is stop ease and check it out. But when you're looking at uh, reporting for adjustments or discounts that you've applied over a set amount of time, it's a lot better if you can see, yep, I have placed X amount of value towards that specific type named adjustment. Whereas if you don't have that predefined, then it's just going to show you a custom discount instead of the actual name. So really great in order to track how much each discount is being used, who's using the discount, and for how much and against what products, really beneficial to have um, predefined discounts in the, in, the, in the back office there set for you guys. So great, so that's a little bit about adjustments and product availability. But as I said, jump into features, definitely something that I highly recommend you guys doing is going through all of the features, give some of them a bit of a read if they, if they kind of catch your eye a bit, and um, as I said, if it's something that you want to enable, you can always just jump into a feature. In this case, it's a really great feature called group ordering. I gave it a bit of a read. I decided I'm actually going to enable it, but I want to ensure that I'm enabling it properly. So again, as I've said, help and support, group ordering, and there we have it. Nice set of you know how the feature works, how to set it up. So definitely now that you know a little bit about navigating between the back office and the pause and getting used to the flow of how the system works, definitely recommend, you know, maybe setting up a few option sets ready to go to have a bit of a play to see how it works. Get through that variant flow as well. This recording, this webinar has actually been recorded. So we are going to be sending it to you in a little bit. So that allows you to, you know, go back and read over, you know, watch over how I actually created the variant if that's going to help. And then once you have a bit more of a play, as I said, features, start giving some of them a read. Some of them might really, really benefit your business. And then obviously you can always touch base with support or the customer success team to help you with whatever it is that you'd like help with. Um, I hope this webinar was beneficial. It's really now up to you guys to have a bit of a play. You can always ask any questions to our team and we'll get back to you. But I hope you enjoyed and enjoy the rest of your day. Hope you stay cool out there and I'll, I'll see you in the cloud. Thanks guys.